really, what can be more important today than for us to come together to reflect on how we can be more effective peacemakers? Our country at war once again. Um, so many of our sisters and brothers, the majority on Mother Earth, struggling for survival. Um, and we're all asking that question, what can we do? And it's not complicated. We know that we have to bring more peace into our lives, into our own hearts, and into our world, if there is to be hope. It took me a long time uh, to learn that and to get to Minnesota. Uh, growing up in the small town in Louisiana, we weren't taught a lot about or challenged about peacemaking. Um, we were so, I guess, docile, trusting of our government. And so it was easy for me when I left college to enter the military. Um, it was the patriotic thing to do. It was during the days of Vietnam when they told us that our cause was noble. We were going to be the liberators. The same language they used to justify the war in Iraq. And I and so many went in the military for all kinds of different reasons. Um, Steve Clemens um, wrote for Wham uh, an article that I found a lot of meaning in uh, recently. It was a mixture of why we entered the military. That machismo was there. It was a ticket out of Louisiana for me. It was part of that patriotism. It was trusting one's leaders. You know, our cause was noble. It, it's a mixture. And then what we learned when we were in Vietnam, and we're learning this now because of Iraq, that our greatest enemy so often in life is ignorance. We know so little about ourselves, about our country's foreign policy, about other countries and their cultures and uh, religious beliefs. History is so much older than our own. And that ignorance gets us in big trouble. And somewhere along the line, we start having these little epiphanies, awakenings, uh, a raising of consciousness. And mine began, I think, in Vietnam. But it was only the beginning. I came back for the first time with the critical consciousness. And it started to grow. And at some point after that, not quite sure, uh, when it happened, but I could no longer go back to the person I used to be. I met kindred spirits. I really met, was blessed to meet peacemakers who was taking me along this road to peace, who really started giving me hope. Now when I talk to high schools, there's nothing more important, I think, when we go into a high school and talk with students or university to just share uh, what we've learned. And one of the things I bring out is, you know, when there can be nothing more serious when our leaders will say we have to go to war and say you must go. One of the very basic things I start with is those who declare the war will not go and fight it nor will their sons and daughters go. Ralph Nader tried to pass, a, he said, a statue. Uh, talked about passing a statue in our government where when Congress would decra declare a war, it would be mandatory for them, the president and all members of Congress, to send their sons and daughters to fight that war. They should go. They should go. <laughs> and knowing, of course, we would have fewer wars. Um, but what can be more important, you know, than, than going off to war? Knowing, of course, that death can be waiting, 
and what our death would mean to our loved ones. And often we don't think about it until we get there. So many, countless numbers in Iraq, over two million of the Vietnamese who continue to grieve for loved ones. And here at home, untold suffering and death and grieving. Madness, madness. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah got it right. He said they will take evil and call it good. They will take the lie and call it truth. And our leaders, political leaders, and often spiritual leaders, I'm sad to say, will do just that. Um, take the evil and call it good, the lie and call it truth. But somewhere along the way, of course, our only hope is that we see that reality. We see the lie. And we simply, at some point on our journey, we say, no, no. I will not fight your war for you. When I left the military, I wanted to be a peacemaker. My faith somehow was ignited. God became closer to me, I think, because of the fear. Um, death was close. And I entered the Marino community and went off to serve the poor in Bolivia for five years. And like Vietnam, it was one of those radicalizing experiences. In Bolivia, I was later assigned to our work in La Paz, where we had been for many years as missioners. And uh, I went into a barrio, which became my home for the next five years. And it was here where the poor became my teachers. Um, they had a hard time teaching me their language, Spanish. Um, I was one of the worst students to ever go through the language school in Cochabamba. When I spoke Spanish, they thought I was speaking this indigenous language, I modeled. <laughs> But really, they introduced to me with a lot of love, with a lot of patience, uh, their struggle. A struggle for liberation, a struggle for justice. Bolivia was like many countries living under a very brutal dictatorship, General Bonzer. The wealth, the power were in the hands of that small elite group. Um, Sad to say, um, the military, of course, were the watchdogs of that wealth and power. And it saddened me to see my country in Bolivia and throughout other countries of Latin America uh, supporting the dictators, protecting our economic interest. We were there, as we are today in so many countries, exploiting the cheap labor, where the huge profits to be made, and of course, exploiting those natural resources. It's not complicated when people day after day, year after year, live in such conditions of poverty and oppression, seeing their children going to bed hungry at night, many of them not making it beyond the age of four or five, they will come together as we would and say basta enough. They start organizing in the tin mines, at the university, in the barrios, the, the workplaces, and they speak about a living wage. They speak about US presence in their country. They speak about the dictatorship who's uh, living off of their blood and sweat. And when they organize, they are seen as el enemigo. It's very dangerous, very dangerous. Uh, many are killed, many are forced into exile. The jails filled up. We formed a human rights group, Dominicans, Jesuits, the people of the barrio, university students, and a few of us were able to get a pass to go into the prisons to visit the political prisoners. Mostly tin miners and university students, factory workers. And we documented many, many cases of torture. And I was able to take these um, 
these papers, the documentation of the torture in a country that we were deeply involved in, giving training and guns to those during the killing, during the torturing. And I went to Washington and knocked on a lot of congressional doors. And when I went back to Bolivia after reporting, giving those findings to members of Congress, someone, which is not rare, notified the government that I was in Washington. And when I got back, not long after, I was arrested and forced out of the country. And when I came home, it was a very lonely time. I really didn't know where to go, what to do. And um, it was the height of the Civil War in El Salvador. Archbishop Oscar Romero had just been killed, gunned down at the, in this little church for his, because of his defense of the poor. Um, four church women who went there at the invitation of uh, Bishop Romero, two of them friends of the Marino community, <clears throat> Maura Clark and Edith Ford, when they were raped and killed by the Salvadoran military, it really shook us. Uh, El Salvador came closer to home. And many of us went to El Salvador to try and find out what was going on, how could this happen. <clears throat> what we found really was a microcosm of Latin America. Once again, we found our country deeply involved. I've never seen anything like El Salvador. I was more fearful there than in Vietnam and Bolivia. Uh, it was the slaughter of the innocents. I have never seen such brutality of a military toward their people. And our country knew exactly what was going on through our embassy there, our CIA doing over time. Um, we were given training and lots of money to those soldiers during the killing at war with their people. And that was wrong. It was a crime against humanity. And when we came back to our own country, we could not shut up. We had to speak out. And um, when we learned that they were training these soldiers, hundreds of them from El Salvador at Fort Benning, we went to Fort Benning for the first time and started organizing. And um, we protested. It was that action that I always had um, great memories over with a lot of fear also. But three of us uh, dressed as army officers went on to Fort Benning and, and broadcast the last homily of Bishop Romero to the Salvadoran soldiers. And um, Bishop Romero has become such an inspiration to his people and to so many of us here. Uh, he is, he's such a model um, for a church leader. So many of our church leaders, as we know, have become corporate executives. As Phil Berrigan said, you know, our shepherds have become government sheep on Iraq. It was the same for Vietnam. On Iraq, silence. Um, during the days of uh, the height of the Civil War in, in El Salvador, silence from our church leaders. But Bishop Romero, I don't know, he had something in his heart we call compassion. He felt very deeply the suffering of his people. And he simply said, I've got a voice. I've got power, I'm a bishop, and I've got to speak. I've got to speak truth to power, knowing the implications. He got the death threats. He said, I've got to keep my hands on the plow. Where am I to go? And he knew the, the, the consequences, and that day came. But he said something that, that's so true. He said, they can kill me, but I will live on in the, the Pueblo. You can kill the messenger, but not the message, you know? And he just, I guess, stretched everybody there in his country, so many people in us at home. And it was his action, his life, that inspired us 
to broadcast his last sermon uh, in, the, in the cathedral the day before he was assassinated, saying to the military, lay down your weapons, stop the killing. And um, we wanted to take his words once again for the Salvadorans being trained at Fort Benning. And it led to prison for a year and a half, but I gotta tell you, no regrets. We were free in prison. We learned that they could, send, they could send us to prison, but they couldn't silence us. When we got out of prison, we couldn't stop the military aid. It got up to a million dollars a day. The bloodshed continued. They went after the Jesuits. Like Bishop Romero, they were seen as el enemigo, the enemy. They were educating the world about what was going on in their country from their university there in San Salvador. And like Romero, they got the death threats, but they stayed the course. And the military entered that November the 16th, 1989, and massacred these six Jesuits. With them, a young mother, Elba, and her teenage daughter, Selena. And that, of course, made our newspapers front pages. Once again, it brought us closer to El Salvador. We all began to ask, what can we do? It was at this time that I was living here in um, the Twin Cities. I had been here for about going my third year and doing a lot of traveling, going into high schools and colleges, mostly talking about El Salvador. And I just come back from a four or five days speaking to her around the state in Iowa. And I remember it was the day before Thanksgiving. I just wanted a little quiet time. I get a call from Rene Hurtado. And he says, we're planning a fast at the cathedral in St. Paul. Uh, I and a group of Salvadorans would like to invite you to be a part of the group. And I said, oh, really? <laughs> Tomorrow, I said, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. <laughs> I don't know if it's such a good time. Maybe a How about the weekend? <laughs> nope. We are going to be meeting here this evening and come. And um, I went. And it was a core of Salvadorans from our community here. It said, we're going to do what we do in our country, El Salvador. We're going to go to the cathedral as we went into the cathedral there in San Salvador and called on our bishop, Bishop Romero, to, to, to help bring justice to our country, to stop the killing. And we're going to call on the bishop here, Bishop Roach and other bishops in the U.S., to do what Bishop Romero said. And I must say, it went to the meeting and with an hour, within an hour, we wrapped it up. There was just a statement, two paragraphs. Um, why we were going to stay in the cathedral after the 10 o'clock mass on Thanksgiving Day in St. Paul. And I got to tell you, uh, I have never, ever participated in an action that, that got such a response in such a short time. Um, it was a water only fast, and we just camped out in the cathedral. And I'll never forget um, the pastor after the last mass on Thanksgiving Day in the big cathedral there in St. Paul. He said, you have, to, you have to go now. You have to get out. We're closing the doors. And that's when the Salvadorans went up and gave him a little slip of paper, a statement. We're staying. And we're calling on our spiritual leaders to stop sending military aid from the U.S. to El Salvador. About 3 o'clock, Archbishop Roach arrived. And he had fire in his eyes. And he came after me first. And I said, well, we're, I'm just a member of the group here. Um, <laughs> you must talk with everyone. Renee was uh, sort of the facilitator. And we asked, can you speak out against this military to El Salvador? 
at first it sounded hopeful, but then it was not hopeful. He couldn't do it. But our fast, a word spread, high school students, <laughs> university students, many, many people of faith connected to a lot of the churches in town um, came. And we, we spent 19 days in that cathedral. It was, um, it was cold, I remember. They turned off the heat. It got down to 17 degrees. We had blankets sleeping on the pews, but people would come to spend, some would miss a meal or come and spend the night. I have never, ever seen that kind of solidarity for any action in such a short time. And on the 19th day, we ended the fast. The cathedral was packed. People were outside. Um, and we had religious leaders there. The Native American community was there. So many people came, including the governor, Perpichu, who was in Perpich at the time. They all, we only invited people to speak from the pulpit if they can say something about stopping the military aid to El Salvador. And um, he said he could do that. And he got up there and he said, I'm not only saying it, but I'm writing a letter to all of my fellow governors in the country to, to call on Congress to stop all military aid immediately. Bishop Archbishop Roach could not do that, therefore he was not able to speak in the cathedral that day. Um, it was a wonderful um, experience. I have great memories of that uh, fast there. And not long after the fast, we learned that uh, those who killed the six Jesuits and the two women were trained at the U.S. Army School of the Americas at Fort Benning, Georgia. And I realized it was time um, to head back to, to Georgia. And I started calling uh, friends in the area. Um, some of the Salvadoran community joined us. Uh, Jim Barnett, uh, Bill's brother, joined us. Bill Barnett and Mary Swenson came down and um, they were our media and support people there. We had Kathy Kelly who came, a Jesuit from Boston, a um, couple of Dominicans. We had 10 of us. And for 19, actually 35 days, we fasted at the main gate. Um, there's something about fasting, I think, that Gandhi uh, taught us and others. Uh, like Cesar Chavez and others. Uh, but they said if when you fast, you can really help expose an injustice. And what they said was so true. If we go into a fast with love in our hearts and in solidarity with people who fast every day, where their, our fasting was, was uh, optional, it could be ended at any time. But as we know, most people in our world, they, they fast every day. Uh, it's a mandatory fast. They go to bed hungry nightly. And we knew that. And, uh, but there was good that came out of that fast, as Gandhi said, and Cesar Chavez, and Dorothy Day, and others. It was our first action to expose and injustice to expose to the public, to Congress, to the media, something that was evil, not knowing where it was going to lead. After the fast, we had to get to work. The next stage in the process was educating ourselves and others about the U.S. Army School of the Americas. And what we learned early on that this school had a lot of history. It had started way back in the 1940s in Panama. It had trained over 50,000 soldiers by the time we arrived on the scene. It was well known as a school of assassins, a school for dictators. Torture was a part of that curriculum that we later discovered thanks to the Washington Post and Joe Kennedy who joined our movement, Joe Kennedy and other members of Congress, 
we decided to take the fast to the steps of the Capitol, and for 40 days we fasted there, a small group of us. And uh, it kind of brought some, again, members of Congress into the movement. When we learned that there were these manuals used in the curriculum that advocated torture, that actually implemented techniques of torture in the curriculum, uh, that called a lot of attention to the issue. When we learned through the United Nations Truth Commission report that those who killed Bishop Romero were graduates, when we learned that those who raped and killed the church women, graduates, the 28 who killed the Jesuits and the two women, 19 of them graduates, and the list went on and on. Something began to happen uh, thanks to the wisdom, the skills of Vicki Emmerman, who joined our little group there early on from Iowa, <laughs> who had just left the military. Uh, I want to just say what, what I've learned in working for peace is that we often discover these skills that we never realized we had. Some of our people have start, started making videos. Vicki Emmerman, when we were in prison, I remember in Tallahassee, Florida for an action early on at the SOA, Vicki, they thought they got rid of the outside agitators. Little did they know. Vicki Emmerman moved into that little apartment where I was living and while I was in prison she went into the headquarters, the library, and started to do extensive research. And she had her past she had from the military to go on and on the on and off the post. And she would often visit me in Tallahassee, Florida with all these findings, graduates of the school many of them dictators, and all these atrocities connected to some of the, the graduates. And I said, Vicki, when, when I get out of prison, what I'll do is take your research and start traveling. And Vicki started the website, our first the website, soaw.org. And she was, again, a skilled researcher and um, put out our first newsletter. And word began to spread. And we started in the early days saying, let us gather at the main gate in November to keep alive the memories of those who were killed, like the Jesuits, the church women, Selena, her mother, Elba, and all the others, the thousands of campesinos. Let, let us keep their memory alive. And let us call for the closing of this school of assassins, all paid for by our tax money. And in the early days, we started with a, with a small group, of course. I think maybe the first group, uh, 100. Um, Steve, the, the, uh, the Koinonia people nearby coming, uh, giving us support from the, in the early days. Uh, and something happened, word spread. And the numbers grew. The next year, 300 came. And then 1,000. This last November, about 20,000 there. Over half who gathered in that sea of people. You notice the thousands of youth who have come into our movement starting years ago. Um, the college students who started coming into the movement maybe seven, eight years ago. Now the high school students are coming. And how much joy this brings to us. And when we gather, it's this celebration of hope. There's a feeling there that's hard to describe because we know why we're there. We're trying in a humble way to connect our lives to sisters and brothers of these countries who have been victims of our country's foreign policy. And we somehow want to connect with them, those whose voices have been taken away and those who continue to speak under very difficult situations. And that's why we're there. And we have speakers. The puppetistas are there. Brings a lot of joy, a lot of musicians. 
Sunday it's more solemn. The funeral procession. They carry the thousands of crosses bearing the names of the victims. Many of them children, their ages, the names are called out. And uh, along with those who gave their lives to peace and justice, Mary Swenson's name, of course, called Rita Steinhagen and others throughout Latin America. Many weep because we're touching on the sacred here. When we get to the fence, those chain link fences with the top, with the barbed wire signs that say no trespassing. We turn it into this memorial wall. We put the crosses and we put the photographs and some with prayers, they put that on that fence. You can't see the other side. Early on, we started to cross that line. Uh, some felt always compelled, it was the time, to take the message on to Fort Benning. And um, when we do that, of course, they say we break the law, we trespass. And well, over 250 of our people over the years now have crossed the line, have become known as our prisoners of conscience. And when they send us to prison, um, it energizes the movement, really. When, oh, we had this Judge Maximum Bob for many years. He retired a few years back, and when he retired at 92, he had been actually on the bench, appointed there by John Kennedy in the 60s. He had been there a long time, didn't like protesters, didn't like us, sent Dr. King and civil rights leaders to prison during the civil rights days. And he sent many of us to prison. And when he retired, I wrote him a letter saying, I hope you enjoy your retirement. <laughs> and I, I just want to thank you, Judge, Your Honor, for helping our movement grow. Because every time you sent us to prison with those harsh sentences, the maximum, you just brought more people into the movement. And that's the way it works. And I think sometimes they have at, um, at the school, at the Pentagon, people who are really on our side and say, we're gonna help that movement grow. <laughs> when they sent Sister Dorothy Hennessy from um, Sister of St. Francis from Dubuque, Iowa to prison, um, Dorothy at the time was 88 years old. And when she was sent to prison with some 28 others for six months, um, she got in the New York Times, a big story, a big photograph. The next day she was on Good Morning America. <laughs> We've never been on Good Morning America before. And something else too, it's amazing what you learn. Uh, when we were first starting to organize in Georgia, they referred to us as a small group of outside agitators. Why don't you just pack up and go home? And then the numbers grew. The hotels were filling up, the restaurants. I get a call after we had about 5,000 who came. I get a call from the Visitors Bureau. <laughs> when is your next <laughs> convention going to be? All of a sudden, they referred to us as a convention coming to town. And what I realized was that we were pumping a lot of money into that community. And really, I did no longer have to call all of these hotels and look for group rates. That was their job. And now really, not all, we've got our critics there, but many look forward to the arrival of the, um, the peacemakers. Uh, really, I lived there now for years and I hear so many good comments about experiences the local people have. Uh, that we can contacts with, with us. Um, some say we've never met peacemakers before, protesters. And um, some now have, you know, on the, the billboards, you know, welcome peacemakers. Uh, we, we're going to be back, of course, the weekend before Thanksgiving. Um, we got work ahead of us. Um, 
we're expecting as many or more than last year. It'd be wonderful if you haven't been there bef down before to think about coming. We have a bill in Congress that's very important. Um, last year, we came within eight votes of shutting it down, cutting off the funding, having the school investigated. Eight votes, we're getting there. And of course, we're hoping with changes in Congress and the White House that uh, this could be our year coming up. Um, the legislative work is very hard, very difficult, but so important. Really, when I have to go to Washington to lobby, sometimes I wish I was in prison where I didn't have to go. <laughs> but it's so important. It is so important. And. Um, what has helped our movement grow, we can all do, like I said, have something to contribute. I see my, my friend Jack Nelson Palmer here early on who came out with his book um, on the SOE issue. That started educating so many people. Um, and then another book and different videos. Let me say something in close with our Latin America initiative that's very important. That has really become, uh, to come to energize our movement. Two years ago, we got a call from friends in Venezuela to come, wanted to know if we were interested in meeting with President Hugo Chavez. Well, that didn't take long to figure, yes. So a few of us are on a flight going to Venezuela and we got that meeting, and it was an important meeting. And I'll never forget meeting you know, in the Palacio with Hugo Chavez, who I'd heard a lot about, and you're always nervous before you go and meet a president, you know, and, but <laughs> he was very cordial. I knew we were in good company. When he, he started off the meeting with us in, in, in um, Caracas by saying, you know, I just came back from a meeting in Mexico with a lot of leaders, and your president, President Bush, was there with us. He said, something's wrong with that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, this is not your average <laughs> diplomat or president. You usually don't start a meeting with foreign visitors with such a kind, but it was a good meeting. And we got right down to the point, Mr. President, we are asking for you and to withdraw your soldiers from this school of assassins. We have in our country a movement working to shut it down and we need your help. Venezuela had sent over 4,000 troops here. And he said to us, I'm gonna get back to you, I've gotta consult my ministers. And just really three weeks later, the official word came to us at the National Office in Washington. Venezuela made a decision to pull out the troops. And at our next meeting in biannual meeting, strategy meeting in Washington, we said, let's now go to all of these other countries of Latin America who are sending their troops here, over 19 countries, and meet with their presidents and defense ministers, indigenous leaders, human rights leaders, and ask them to pull out their troops. So we put together our our delegation, Lisa Sullivan. We were so blessed when Lisa, who had been a Marino Lay missioner for 22 years in Venezuela, who now in, in Latin America, uh, who's living now in Venezuela, to come on board as our coordinator. Very, very, very um, excellent in the language, so knowledgeable of Latin America. and. Carlos Mauricio from El Salvador, a survivor of torture. And joining us also was a Jesuit, Joe Mulligan, some of you may know from Nicaragua. Uh, we got on the road. It's been a busy couple of years. We visited this last year uh, over, let's see, well, 14 countries. And let me just say there is a sea change taking place in Latin America today countries for so many decades who have been dominated by our country, often referred to, I notice 
There's a different language they're using today in our travels. So many refer to our country as El Imperio, the empire, the empire. Some refer to us as the conquistadors, the new ones, uh, who came into their countries from Spain and Portugal many years ago. Now we're the new conquistadors. And why we are there for the same reason, to enrich ourselves from their cheap labor and their vast natural resources. Well, what's happening today in Latin America is leaders the people are bringing into their governments people like Evo Morales in Bolivia, Rafael Correa in Ecuador, and Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, President Lugo in Paraguay, and others. And what's going on is not complicated. They are saying to the empire, El Imperio, no mas. You, we are not allowing you to come into our country as before. You are welcome, but no come on antes. You can come into our country if you can be a partner in our development. And I have to tell you, under this present administration, they, there's no such thing as being a partner in another country's development. No. What's happening too in many of these countries, that fear that was so alive. When I left Bolivia years ago and there was such fear there in so many countries, Argentina, Chile, Peru, fear dominated really by the, by the militaries that were really kept in power by our country. But that fear today is being replaced by hope, by hope. And we were in Argentina for the 30th anniversary of that coup that began the dirty war. And President Kirchner, before tens of thousands there in the plaza, he said this, which is really being repeated in many countries. Nunca mas, he said, never again will we allow our military to do what you did to us. Shame, he said, shame on you. And he said, shame on our media for not reporting the truth, for being silent. And he also said, shame on the church leaders for their silence and alliance to the military. And we heard this in different ways in other countries. Well, I'm happy to report after visiting some 14 countries and talking with presidents, defense ministers, human rights leaders in many um, press conferences, giving talks in some of the universities in these countries. I'm happy to report that we have now have five countries who have severed their ties to the school. The first, of course, Venezuela, and then Argentina, Uruguay, Costa Rica, and the last one, just a few months ago, we had that meeting with President Evo Morales a year ago. Five o'clock in the morning, we're at the Palacio waiting. He starts his day early. He meets, he is of the indigenous, the Aymara. In a country where the majority are indigenous, he is the very first president to be in, uh, from the indigenous people, incredible. And there's such hope there. And he said, of course, that he had to consult others. And just a few months ago, he called a press conference in La Paz and announced that Venezuela, that Bolivia would be pulling out all of their troops. In the in, in, in latter part of October, our delegation's heading to Paraguay hopefully for a meeting with President Lugo, who is really connected with the poor, who's well known, sort of like Bishop Romero. This guy is a, also a, a bishop, well loved by the poor. And then we're going off to Chile. After Colombia, Chile has more soldiers coming to that school down in Georgia than any other. We've got to get to Chile. We've got to start a campaign in Chile. 
we do have in these countries, wherever we go, uh, local leaders who work in solidarity with us. And I want to just say in closing that many people know of our movement when we meet with them, but they are quite surprised to hear the size of the movement. They are really surprised when they hear that over 250 of our people in the movement have been sent to prison and have gone to prison in solidarity with them. And we travel, of course, with literature in Spanish. It's called Voices in Solidarity. Voices in Solidaridad. And really, that's what it's about. Solidarity. Solidarity. And that's why we're going to keep moving ahead. Our hope is strong. And uh, coming back to the Twin Cities, to Minnesota, kind of really keeps my hope very alive. Um, I want to thank you in closing for all of your uh, persistence, your ongoing work over all these years. More than ever, we know that we need each other. And so we move ahead with hope and a lot of love in our hearts. Thank you. On behalf of all at the SOA Watch, bienvenidos, welcome. 18 years ago, 10 of us gathered at the main gate to call for the closing of this school of assassins. Word began to spread around the country about this training and its implications to sisters and brothers of Latin America. Today we have over 20,000 here. We gather, as our movement began to grow and blossom, we felt it was very important to root it in nonviolence. Our way was gonna be the way of peace. And so we drew on the wisdom and the experience of Mahatma Gandhi, Dr. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Cesar Chavez, Dorothy Day, and others. There is a group in this community called God Bless Fort Benning. I just want to say this that I think someone has to say. God does not bless war. God, God does not bless killing. God does not bless violence. We are here in the name of nonviolence, peace, love, support, solidarity with the people of Latin America and Iraq who are the victims of violence. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah put it this way, they will take evil and call it good. They will take the lie and call it truth. Our president and those architects of the war, those at the Pentagon and some in this community are doing just that, living out in a real way the words of Isaiah, calling evil good, calling the lie the truth. Finally, we are awakening to that lie and we are saying no, no, not in our name. And that's why we are here today. There's only one word to describe what we are doing, our foreign policy in this school, what they are doing in Latin America. There's only one word to describe what our nation, known as the empire to, to so many, what we are doing in Iraq. And that word, shame, shame. Shame, shame, shame.